All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Remy Drabkin. It's May 9th, 2017, and we're here at Remy's Winery. And Remy, we'll start you off with an easy one, which is why wine? Why wine? Why wine? Um, well, that is easy. <laughs> uh, that's the only thing I've ever wanted to do or to be. Um, I uh, grew up in the area, and um, you know, it was a very small industry when I when I was growing up. It was a handful of families making wine. Um, Nick of Nick's Italian Cafe put everybody's wine on um, his wine list, and what that created was a small uh, tight-knit community and that's who I grew up around amongst um, and so by the time I was eight years old I knew I wanted to be a winemaker I loved going out uh, to pick grapes at Ponzi and I loved pressing off Muscat at Irie and taking home empty milk jugs full of uh, uh, full of juice so you know there was just a the, I was just enchanted from a very very young age and watching this process I you know of course I didn't really understand the wine side of mm -hmm. it at that age but I loved the process and the process is still what I love so um, it's the only thing I've ever wanted to do or to be I just love it yeah. So as an eight-year-old uh, and already deciding, how were you aware of wine at that point? How, how did you know about Ponzi and Irie and, and the rest? How did you get into that community? Uh, my mom worked at Nick's Italian Cafe. She also was the first culinary director of the International Pinot Noir Celebration. Um, and so these were just, were and are friends and family. Mm -hmm. um, there just, it wasn't a process of coming to know about um, or, or learn about the wine industry. I, uh, even though my family wasn't in the wine industry, I still grew up in the wine industry in, in Oregon. Um, and you know, a lot of the people that have, that have now taken over their family wineries, um, those people were all just barely, a, not even a generation in front of me. You know, they were mm -hmm. maybe 10 years older um, than I was or than I am and so you know when you are six seven eight years old the 16 17 <laughs> and 18 year olds those are like the coolest people in the world sure, sure. and uh, so not only did I see you know and and have the experience of this incredible community um, but additionally I had these young to be winemakers going off to study wine in France and at Davis and various places um, with the intent of coming back and running their family wineries. And I always had a desire to emulate that. That's so cool. It's such a cool story. Um, so you have this early passion in wine and now you have a winery. So take us mm -hmm. down the road from how you got to point A to point B. Sure. Um, well, I got probably in the way a lot, as I can only imagine <laughs> if I had um, uh, 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 somebody that was as inquisitive <laughs> as I tend to be around during harvest. <laughs> but I was never treated that way. I was um, given a lot of information from an early age. I was given important jobs to do from an early age. I was uh, involved in the winemaking process and then I applied for an intern position at Ponzi for the 1995 harvest um, and I was and and I was given that position which, which was in, really incredible and it was a very generous thing um, of the Ponzi family to do because you know by that time um, Oregon, the Oregon wine industry was no longer nascent as mm -hmm. it had been when mm -hmm. I was growing up in it. And certainly they had a lot of applicants for that job. Sure. Um, but they, they gave me that position and then they really gave me that position. I mean, I, I was thrown full <laughs> in to that process. Um, and from that point forward, I worked harvest with them my loving mother drove me to the winery. <laughs> the harvest started before the school year started, so she would drive me out there every day. You know, I wasn't old enough to drive yet. Um, 
and uh, then after the school year started, she would drive me there after school and on weekends. I mean, really, I, I, I wouldn't, I never would have gotten going if it wasn't for the tremendous amount of support um, that I was given both by my, my family and my uh, extended family, so to speak. <laughs> um, and uh, so that was, that was the start. And then I applied for a job with um, Rob Stewart, who was the winemaker at Erath at the time. And I worked for Rob all through, um, all through high school. And um, after high school, I traveled to and lived in um, Israel and uh, France. In Israel, I was actually hired to work at Golan Heights Winery, um, but right after I was hired, I found out that I, would never, I wouldn't be able to touch the wine because I was a woman and because um, I wasn't Hasidic and the, and the winery was kosher. kosher and, so because I, and so because of like the various social or cultural or however you want to reflect on that, but for all that I was, mm -hmm. I, w I was hired to be part of that team and then really couldn't do it. So I decided to leave Israel. Um, I got an interview with, I'm giving you the full. This is perfect, this is okay. what we want. I, I, uh, I, I got an introduction at the Lycée Viticole de Bon, um, which is a school in Burgundy. Um, it's a school where a lot of uh, the wine families in Burgundy send their children um, to study different disciplines, either winemaking or wine marketing sales. Uh, I got an introduction there by the Joan family, who I had worked for very briefly also um, while I was, while, while here uh, during high school. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was accepted to that school. Again, community. I mean, I was not fluent in French. I'd studied French, but I was not fluent in French. Um, and they had a policy of not accepting anybody <laughs> that was under the age of 18, but I was soon to be 18, and, and so they accepted me. And um, I went to that, uh, I went to that school um, which actually turned out to be, you know, not being fluent, fluent in French and doing not just chemistry, but college level chemistry and mm. beyond that doing college level chemistry specific to winemaking in, an, in French was tremendously challenging. <laughs> um, I had a great time. I learned a lot. Uh, not necessarily through the channels that I thought I was going to learn, but I learned a lot. Um, I also met um, Josh and Caroline Bergstrom. They had just started dating. Uh, Caroline was at the Lycée Viticole de Bonne as well. Um, she kind of took me under her wing there, and you know, I sat with her at lunchtime and things like that. And, and Josh was at the neighboring school, the Cef Pepea, which uh, is also a, a school that's fully um, focused on winemaking. But he uh, he was fluent in French. He had his undergraduate degree, etc. But we became uh, really fast friends and. Um, we would go down to this one little wine shop and they had a, you've seen probably these, it's called Ne de Vin, which is, you know, the nose of wine. Mm -hmm. So they have these boxes and it's like 300 different scents. They make them, they make them, for, they make them in like nine packs, 25 packs or 300 packs. <laughs> and they're these concentrated smells. Um, and so we would go down there and we would open these up and we would smell them and, and you know, kind of test ourselves. What is that, you know? And so it's so important in the winemaking process to be able to identify smells and flavors or same thing. But, um, you know, so that was hugely important and I got to try amazing wines and, and you know, really discover the, that region and the area. Um, so that was uh, tremendously influential. I came back to Oregon um, at the end of that term, went to uh, back to work at, at ERATH, enrolled in Linfield, mm -hmm. um, started studying there um, and doing that. And then I was seeing somebody who got a full ride to Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. And um, 
So I followed her and off we went. And we went to Pittsburgh and I ended up managing this little Italian restaurant and bakery <laughs> where they happened to make wine in the basement. <laughs> and it was very, there was a lot of aspects to it that, where there was kind of this stereotypical culture of like the women would cook while the men were um, making the wine in the basement. And I started asking questions of these guys. It was mostly just this, uh, again, a you know, great community of people that were coming together. They were having grapes shipped in from the um, West Coast, mostly from California. And it was every kind of Italian varietal you can think of. <laughs> and they were coming in these very romantic little wooden fruit boxes and they would carry them down on their shoulders into the basement where they had like a hundred year old wine press and they had a hand to stemmer and they'd ferment them and they'd gotten old whiskey barrels from you know neighboring states that they were aging the wine in but I started asking questions and I remember this one uh, man in particular uh, who was a doctor and he he got really excited and he got a package in the mail one day and all these guys were looking at it and I walked over and it was you know, a very basic piece of winemaking equipment but he purchased a refractometer and so I was like oh I, you know, I just started conversating with him about it and um, he couldn't believe that I knew what it was but of course I mean it's just it was very elementary for mm -hmm. me at that point but because of that I was able to get involved in that process with those guys which was pretty amazing because it was definitely like the men and the women mm -hmm. and I got to bridge that gap um, and uh, it really spoke to me in a way that I knew that I was missing something uh, by not being in the wine industry um, and so I applied for a job at Argyle mm -hmm. um, and you know at that point I'd had a lot of training in the lab and um, you know I had a lot of experience under my belt really and even though I was very young um, and I'd had really two very strong mentors at that uh, at, by that point in my life um, and so uh, the winemaker, kind of acting winemaker at the time, Willie Lunn, hired me to come in um, and run their lab, which was huge because I didn't have all of the experience that one would need to do the lab work. Um, but he and Rollin then became, um, you know, yet they mentored me yet again and they taught me the, not only how to do all this analysis, but they really gave me um, the background in it. Now, of course, I mentioned that I had enrolled in Linfield, so I had transferred to a school in Pennsylvania, gone there for a little while, but I'd kind of been wish-washy with my education at that point. Um, and so I was working for Rollin, and um, I remember sitting down with him one day. I'd been there for a couple of years uh, and, you know, asking for a raise. And uh, he just said to me, he said, you know, you're, you're great and I see you have the passion for this, but you never completed your undergraduate degree and you'll never be the winemaker here if you don't complete a degree, um, which was really hard mm -hmm. to hear, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's really important. Um, it's certainly a message that not only motivated me, but that I've um, tried to share with other young people is that you know that the the really it, the, the how crucial an education is um, even if it's not in your field it's just so crucial mm -hmm. so I re-enrolled in school and at Linfield um, kept working for Argyle for a while and then it was just kind of time to go. You know, sometimes you get to that place at a, at a, at a job or just any, any phase of mm -hmm. life and it's just, it's a natural time for it to come to an end. And um, so that happened. And uh, I left Argyle. I went to work for another winemaker just for Harvest, uh, somebody that I really respected. Um, and at that point, I really, like, I had a more comprehensive understanding of the winemaking process as a whole. Um, that, that lab aspect had really been missing before, um, before Argyle. And um, 
so then I stayed on at this other winery. Um, it, consulting wouldn't be the right word, but I was kind of a contract lab person. Mm -hmm. It was great because <laughs> I started working on other creative projects um, in the area. Um, I opened a wine bar while I was, you know, moonlighting essentially mm -hmm. as a lab tech and, um, I, you know, it was a good time and um, as I, as I kind of went through that, I also had this opportunity come up where um, there was a guy that had a winery, he wasn't use, utilizing it to its full, you know, he built this huge wine, not huge, much larger than this winery, but he, <laughs> he had built this winery, he wasn't using it to its full capacity. He really needed um, a winemaker. and. Um, so I made a deal with him where I would come in and do his wine, make, wine making for him. And um, part of my compensation was space to produce my own wine. And so I launched Remy Wines in 2006 um, while making his wine. It was a huge harvest. Uh, I, he, I mean, just the, the year in general was a huge harvest for everybody. Mm -hmm. It was a really warm year. There was tons of fruit. <laughs> Um, but then, especially because I was doing all of his winemaking, he had no other employees or consultants, whatever you, you, you want to call them. I, I, it was just me, and I, so I was doing 60 tons of fruit for him, <laughs> plus uh, I started with nine tons of fruit for myself. And then I actually uh, started three wives at the same time, and that was kind of circumstantial in that um, we had two tons of Pinot Blanc at his vineyard, which I'd been caring for, um, that were not under contract. And so I had this opportunity to get a really good buy on Pinot Blanc, but it didn't fit the model that I had laid out for Remy Wines, which was kind of pulling in all these things from my past. Remy Wines is all Italian varietal focused. Mm -hmm. um, Italian varietals grown in the Pacific Northwest, but that's that was very much the focus of the brand at the time, so I felt like I couldn't do Pinot Blanc because it, it would start to mm -hmm. muddy the waters. Mm -hmm. um, and so I launched the Three Wives label then at the same time, really just for this <laughs> opportunity to make uh, Pinot Blanc um, without without doing too many things under one brand. Sure. That is the very long story of how I got here. And, then, and now we're 11 years later. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> I've never told it in full before, I don't think, but <laughs> you asked. You're going to edit it, so I figured I might as well. <laughs> you can take what you want, right? <laughs> so what about this actual building we're in now? So after starting the winery in 2006, I worked out of that facility for two years. Then um, that was in Gaston. So the commute was really hard, um, especially during harvest mm -hmm. and, you know, windy road. I had a good friend that was uh, uh, working for the sheriff at the time. He's a police officer now, but he told me very high level of accidents mm -hmm. on that particular, you know, road, yeah. Highway 47. And it was hard. And I, and, uh, there was an opportunity to move to a shared space facility in McMinnville that was opening up. So I moved there. Um, I only did one harvest there. I was actually not uh, um, really happy with the equipment that, that when, I, when I signed the lease for that space, um, they hadn't equipped it yet. And then the end result was I, I really didn't like the equipment that they ended up purchasing. And um, I, that kind of motivated me to to look out for my own space. Um, I was evaluating two different places. One, um, just a block from here and where Matello now is, um, and then this space. And um, I was anxious to take on uh, the square footage of that other facility. Um, plus, the landlord here was phenomenal right from the start. Um, I, it's a husband-wife team. We hit it off right away. I just felt like there was a good relationship and, and there really has been. So I've been in this space since 2009. In 2011, the 
space adjacent but in the same building became available. Um, I took that, I expanded into that space, opened the R bar in 2011. Um, and now we are, th we're, through this summer, we're going to be open in the R bar and then we're, we also planted um, some, some land that my parents had, um, had that they were just renting the farmhouse out on. Um, we planted that in 2009, and so this summer we're actually expanding and opening a, a tasting room out nice. at the vineyard as well. Nice. And where's that? That is, uh, well, it's in the Dayton watershed, but okay. it's on the corner of McDougal and Brayman Orchard. Oh, nice. um, so uh, McDougal is the road that um, Stoller is on, and um, Brayman Orchard is the road that goes up to if it starts with the domain, <laughs> goes, up, goes up there. So it's a phenomenal nice. location. Nice. And uh, we're excited to open there in July of 2017. Nice. That's our goal. That's exciting. Yeah. I was, the, my next question was going to be choosing to be in the city versus choosing to be in the country and how, and if you had regretted that decision at all. But I see you're going to try to have both now. But when, yeah. you, when, you were, when you were planning, did you ever consider not being in McMinnville? It was a huge benefit moving to McMinnville for me. Um, it's nice to live where you work mm -hmm. or work where you live. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, you know, this, the, I always saw the opportunity at the farmhouse um, and it was just kind of a matter of, of, of getting there. Um, who, I mean, I'm, I'm, I am happy here. I, you know, we are uh, in a very highly regulated industry, We're regulated by the federal government, the state government. Um, at this farmhouse, I'm going to be regulated by the county, but here I'm regulated by the city. You know, I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there, I, I think that there are pros and cons to being in the city, being in the county, um, but in this particular instance, the uh, benefit of being able to put a tasting room um, right in the middle of where there's lots of people traveling is um, just an undeniable yeah. amazing opportunity <laughs> yeah. so definitely yeah so you talked about the R bar earlier your tasting room how would you it's, it's a definitely a unique kind of a unique tasting room how would mm -hmm. you describe it or what, what are you going for in there um, I wanted to create a space where I would want to be um, so again, kind of pulling on that history of, um, you know, that restaurant in um, Pittsburgh, plus the, you know, growing up in the restaurant, um, you know, like, I mean, it's like Frank Sinatra is like my <laughs> anthem, right? Any song by Frank Sinatra, is, is, or, you know, Dean Martin. So it's like, I, you know, put, put, the, put Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin in your head and then imagine where you are. Nice. That's what I wanted. But really where I was was in a warehouse and I had really no budget to um, create a tasting room space. Um, and so I used what I had available to me. Largely, uh, that was pallets. <laughs> so um, I had three friends came and we broke pallets and we broke pallets and until we had these individual pieces of wood and it was amazing because you started with uh, a scrap pile mm -hmm. right of something we would normally kind of almost have to pay at times to to get rid of we broke it into these pieces which then it really looked like a you know a <laughs> junk pile and then all of a sudden you just started seeing the beauty in these individual pieces of wood and so we took the walls of this warehouse um, and we started screwing in the boards from the pallets that had been broken apart. And um, it was like, I mean, it was a meditative experience <laughs> and picking out these pieces of wood and you would see, you know, oh, this one has like some blue spray paint on it or, you know, this or that or the other. And, oh, is this one going to look good over this one? So we created this space. Um, Portland Monthly called it, uh, shit, I'm going to forget, the, what did they refer to it as? Um, steampunk. 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 Yes. Not a lot of that in the Oregon wine industry. Not a lot of steampunk, <laughs> especially steampunk with uh, 
Frank Sinatra in the background. <laughs> but it, it's always worked. Yeah. Um, I wanted to have some food available. We've done very light fare. We were also, you know, again, highly regulated. Yeah. So um, we're regulated by the Department of Agriculture. I didn't want to push our menu to the brink of bringing in yet another agency, the Department of Health. So um, we've done very creative but delicious dishes. Um, you know, we bring in, we now grow about 200 tomato plants at the farm, mm. at, the, at the vineyard. And um, so, you know, in the summer we offer beautiful caprese salads and, and things of that nature. So sure. it was a very natural evolution. Sure. Yeah. It's kind of a nice mix of what you think of with the Oregon tasting room, the kind of that mixed with kind of the urban winery. It's kind of a nice, like a, a combination of those two things a little bit. I hope like. so. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> That's I would hang out here. <laughs> so you talked a little bit about your, your kind of winemaking evolution and, and the kind of formative experience of working the restaurant and Italian varietals and then consciously choosing to do Italian wine. Um, did you ever regret not being a Pinot Noir, not not doing the, not doing what everybody else in the area was doing? I never regretted it because I never wasn't doing it. I just didn't get any attention for it, <laughs> and so then it became like a secret. So I I was producing Pinot. Mm -hmm. I was putting it under. I was going to put it under my Three Wives label. Um, because it wasn't an Italian varietal, and again, I didn't want to murky, you know, muddy those waters. Um, but all of a sudden, I was getting attention from, you know, national websites for making Le Grime. and so I shied away from it. And mm -hmm. I, um, it was great wine, but I sold it all on the bulk market uh, for a good, good value, not cheap, discounted bulk wine. Mm -hmm. Good you know, really good Pinot Noir uh, available for bulk purchase. Uh, and I just didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like I had created some weird vortex of <laughs> marketing nightmare for myself <laughs> of like, well, I'm, you know, I'm doing something totally different, which is great and people love that. But now what am I gonna do with the stuff that's the same? Um, and so, yeah, that's what I, I did with that for years. And then I decided one year to do a, I called it a Pinot Nouveau. So in the, um, you know, following the idea of a Beaujolais Nouveau, um, I pressed off this Pinot. I didn't do it totally traditionally. It wasn't, you know, I didn't do carbonic maceration and all that. Like, I just pressed off this Pinot that I was making and it was just phenomenal and I thought, this doesn't need to sit in barrel for another year. This is great. I bottled it. I called it Jules, which was my father's name. Um, we were able to offer it at a great value because, uh, you know, because it spent no time in barrel. Yeah, right. I think sometimes that's an under undervalued part of the cost of wine sure. is not only are the barrels themselves expensive, they take up a tremendous amount of space and you're leaving, you know, all of your product that's sitting in there. There is a huge time sure. delay between the cost of making that wine and before it, any of that starts coming back in. Sure. Um, so we were able to offer it uh, quite inexpensively. I think uh, $15 a bottle was the cost of our um, jewels, and. Uh, then at that point, I kind of decided to, to, to make the leap and, and start offering Pinot Noir. Um, I also wanted to create a distinction between that Pinot Nouveau and this new product, was a, which was an, an aged, you know, mm -hmm. barrel-aged Pinot Noir, and so uh, called a Giulio, which would be Jules in Italian, and also happens to be the given name of my late father-in-law. So um, got to honor both of these really cool. men with that name. Yeah. Um, so how would you describe your either winemaking philosophy or sort of your winemaking style? <laughs> I, re I mean, really, like, the, stay out of your own way. If you're working with good fruit and you keep your winery clean and you keep your equipment clean and you're diligent about those things, um, you're going to end up with a good product. Um, 
there will be some variation if you, you know, pick too soon or pick too late, you know, those types of things. But um, all of that kind of comes down, I think, just to experience of going out and being able to taste through a vineyard and say, you know, I want a little more flavor here mm -hmm. or whatnot. Um, and then keep your barrels topped up and you keep keep things clean. And I mean, really, so I think sometimes the winemaking process can be overdone and people add enzymes to break down for color and this and that and the other. And I just have a very, you know, our, our, our tagline is old world style wines. And I have this very old world approach. If I want more color in the wine, I cold soak it longer. You know, if I, um, if I, if I'm going for a certain flavor development, a lot of that can be constructed through when you bring in fruit, you know, or you, you, you can let something hang longer and you know where those flavors are going to trend towards. It's not that you can say, well, I want my wine to taste like this. Um, you know, your, your, your decision about how much oak and what kind of oak, all of those things, you know, you, you just, you get a sense for the effect on the wine. Um, and so really I think my winemaking style is one very acid driven because I like a lot of acid in my wines mm -hmm. um, and then mostly it's trying to really express the fruit and that varietal. I want to do very authentic expressions of uh, whatever varietal I'm working with. And you said you're you've had you know positive feedback for your Italian wines was there uh, was there any kind of learning curve for your consumers who maybe may not have been as familiar with your style of wine versus the other ones in the area or do people come into it excited yeah, about it no I mean when I so I started Remy wines in 2006 I my entire marketing budget was my business cards you know I started this winery by taking out small business loans working um, other jo two other jobs at the same time um, to you know pay for my wine making mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my, to, to, to pay my bills while I was starting on this venture um, and uh, I was making Dolcetto and Lagrin that were grown in the Willamette Valley um, and then I I mean, there was, I, and I put the, everything under a glass cork right away because uh, part of my job at Argyle had been, um, I did just cork trials and cork trials and cork trials, <laughs> and there was always CCA, and I didn't want to have corked wines. Um, if somebody didn't like my wine, I wanted it to be because they didn't like my wine, right. <laughs> not because it was spoiled by the, sure. by the closure, and I knew I couldn't put it under screw cap. So I had like this really weird product, uh, really. And um, I remember showing up to sell the wines to like wine shops and people were like, what? <laughs> like, what, what, Are, what is this? Sure. Lagrine from the Willamette Valley and it just spent two years in barrel and it's under a glass cork. I mean, yeah, there was a, a steep learning mm -hmm. curve. Um, now, what we find is that people refer, when, you know, when people are out tasting and they say, you know, I'm really done with Pinot, <laughs> then they say, go to Remy. And um, it's not that we don't offer a Pinot, uh, we do, uh, but um, now it's kind of come full circle in that there's, uh, uh, again, a benefit to having this, these kind of alternative offerings. Sure. Um, so you talk about your marketing budget at the beginning and, <laughs> and how small it was. So what is it like to kind of market and sell wines in a small production winery like this? Uh, you know, it's a constant challenge and I think that the, the key is to be proactive and to always have a plan. So we're constantly evaluating and reevaluating um, our marketing plan. I've never followed uh, traditional routes, so I'm, you know, I don't have a distributor. I'm not distributed in other states. Um, our focus is really exceptional customer service, and um, uh, and I think through that, you know, people have a great experience with the wines themselves, but then they also have a great experience when they're in our space. 
Um, we try to take really good care of them, but the, but it is a constant evaluation. I mean, <laughs> the wine, you know, the the wines sell themselves, but they don't sell themselves, <laughs> right? Like mm -hmm. they're not going anywhere if you if you don't make an effort to do it. Uh, I was out um, recently. The wine uh, buyer for the Dundee Bistro changed. Um, and so I made an appointment with her and I went out and I was showing her our whole lineup um, because, you know, she was familiar with the winery from having worked there, uh, worked at the Dundee Bistro, but um, she'd never tasted through everything. So I set up this appointment and I went out and I poured, and of course the Dundee Bistro is owned by the Ponzi family and so mm -hmm. I'm leaving and Nancy says, Remy, what, you know, what are you doing? And I said, well, Nancy, you know, I'm, I'm here to sell wine. <laughs> and she goes, I know, I kept telling you, you know, you had to sell it. And I was like, no, Nancy, you never told me I had to sell it. You never told me I had to sell it. <laughs> um, you know, the sales are an interesting part. They come uh, naturally to me because I like people and I like sharing my story clearly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I couldn't be more talkative today, holy cow. But, um, uh, you know, it, it, that part of it, it kind of comes naturally to me. but. It's not lost on me that we do have a very um, hand sell item, you know. I mean, Lagrine from the Willamette Valley, two years in barrel, which then means that it's not an inexpensive bottle of wine. Um, that is very much a hand sell item. Mm -hmm. So we we are religious about um, reviewing our marketing plan for the next three months, six months, 12 months. Mm -hmm. And now with the new the new facility opening up, are you, is that gonna be more more wine overall? Are you gonna have more production? Nope. Or is it just, just, just spreading it out a little bit? Yeah, it's just a different, uh, you know, it's just a, a different method to, uh, a different platform for people to try our sure. wines. Uh, we're not upping production. We're at a really comfortable level. Um, we're at a comfortable level of staffing. You know, we have a really solid team here. Um, and for me, the winemaking isn't only about the product, it's also about a, um, being able to create a, an atmosphere in which people really enjoy coming to work, um, and myself included. Mm -hmm. So. Sure. That, that remains a, a, a huge goal for us, and I don't have any desire to make, the, you know, we, we're, we've, we've reached our capacity in this space, so any more that we were to do would just, you know, sometimes bigger is just bigger. <laughs> we don't need to be bigger. Um, sure. Yeah, my goal is always to work less hard. <laughs> I don't do it very well, <laughs> but it's the, it's the goal. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a tough goal in this industry. Nobody ever seems to be able to achieve that goal, but it's it's good to work toward, right? But it's a focus. It's a focus. I'm not sure that everybody <laughs> takes it on as a goal. True. We have a very definite goal here uh, over this last year and continuing um, for the next year. So we're really evaluating process improvement. What can we take and do better? How mm -hmm. can we make such and such easier or better so that it's not like, oh, you know, because you have those moments where you're like, I can't even believe that I didn't realize that the whole time. So we've really been um, breaking down everything and looking at it and trying mm -hmm. to make it better. Nice. Uh, every, every system we have in place is um, up for review and uh, some, things stay the th some things stay the same and some sure. things get better. Nice. Yeah. That's a good way to do it. Yeah. So do you have a favorite wine to, eat, to make or to drink? Mm. They, you know, you can't say that. They're like <laughs> children, right? They are. Sure. They're all different, in, interesting. They'll hear you, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. So, um, I do think the wines are best when they get a healthy dose of Led Zeppelin. Um, but beyond that, I mean, I, you know. You know, you kind of have a little place in your heart. But sometimes you want to drink this and sometimes you want to drink that. Sure. So, um, Was there a particular memorable vintage for you? One that either went where things were really easy or where things were an extra challenge? Um, yeah, I've had both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> I've definitely had both. Um, y you know, my uh, uh, I started. In, um, hmm. Yeah, the, you know, the good ones are easy, and so your best vintage. It's like a. It's like a good dream, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're like, ah, oh, God, I just woke up and I feel great. <laughs> you know, really, like, I don't know exactly what happened, but that I just, I just feel lovely today, <laughs> and that's a, that's a good vintage. There's, you know, maybe a relationship that formed. Um, certainly, I've had a lot of those experiences where I've made very good friends uh, in the course of a vintage. Um, the bad ones are the exact opposite. They, you know, if you're having a rough vintage, it's just a rough vintage because you never have a chance to reset, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when harvest starts, it is nonstop. You work until the work is done. And um, that can easily be three months of showing up. So, if, you know, if things start going wrong, if you have God forbid equipment problems. I mean, that's like, <laughs> I mean, this is the one thing you don't want to have are equipment failures. Um, but you know, when you're having a rough one, it's just a rough one. Luckily, we're in a great community and Oregon, um, you know, the, the nature of the Oregon industry is to help your neighbor, help your friend, whether that's with information or equipment and whatnot. Mm -hmm. so, even the even the hard ones or even the rough ones still it's you know there's there's an element that it's always going to be okay <laughs> you know you'll make it through mm -hmm. so so you talked a bit earlier about all the all the amazing mentors you've had in the industry and you kind of checked off almost most of the big names in the Oregon wine industry as people you've worked for or worked with or, or had mentors have you found yourself now and more as you're establishing yourself in more of a mentorship role with with young people in the industry um, well, I don't know. I think you'd have to ask the people that I've worked with that question. I don't, I don't know if they, if anybody views me in that role. Uh, I wouldn't say that that's something that I, you know, am attributing mm -hmm. uh, to, to what I'm doing here. Um, you know, as I said already, I do focus really on trying to create a good team. Um, mm -hmm. And through that, I try to be a good uh, leader and, and um, you know, create a really wonderful experience. Um, uh, you know, I do also, um, I was elected to the city council. I spent four years on the planning commission for the city of McMinnville. Um, so I definitely have, um, you know, my thumb in a lot of pots and I have a lot of kind of outreach that's happening. I also think that one thing that I've, I, I don't know if this is different or if everybody does it and <laughs> I just caught on, but some of um, the really interesting and really educational uh, relationships and dynamics we've had is not with young people, which in your question you, you asked if I had mentored young people, but we've had uh, more than one person who is seeking a career change mm -hmm. um, that has come here uh, as that transitional point. And those relationships are ones that I have learned a lot, I've learned a lot from those people and the feedback that I get um, is that they have also taken away a lot. So currently our seller master, um, and I hope for a very long time, <laughs> our seller master, Ralph Rogers, who's been a just tremendous asset to the winery. Um, you know, he was formerly an engineer. Um, uh, we had uh, one harvest, we had an intern, um, who, a man who had been uh, an emergency room doctor um, and had retired from that. He had started young. Um, He'd worked in emergency rooms for 20 years, but he'd started working in emergency rooms when he was in, you know, maybe 24 years old. Oof. So. Um, he was still very young, looked, seeking a career change, and now he's uh, a winemaker, an assistant winemaker, uh, you know, at, at another winery. So, um, I think those relationships have been really 
really beneficial, not, not seeking to teach, but continuing to learn sure. from others. So you mentioned a little bit about your, I was going to ask you a bit later about your, the kind of organizations you're involved in outside of the winery. So you're, you're very involved here in McMinnville. Mm -hmm. um, any, is there anything else besides what you mentioned? And, and is there kind of a motivation behind that beyond just your own desire to be part of other things? Or um, there, I, I've been involved in so too many organizations. <laughs> I, I mean, it's true. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually read um, uh, this book on leadership um, that Susan Sokol Blosser wrote and it was like a it was like a flip book I mean it was like a, almost like a little kids book for leadership right big words simple statements um, and part of it was uh, and I remember this so clearly part of it was uh, it's a it's okay to say no or learn to say <laughs> no um, you know, there was no organized marketing effort for the McMinnville area and so I got together with Maria Stewart and Irie and um, you know a few others and we started we started a nonprofit whose focus was marketing then um, uh, we actually about two years ago so I chaired that uh, and then we handed it over to the McMinnville Downtown Association um, and then I've just been involved in a lot of stuff now my focus is really it's on council and council um, Council could be a full-time job if I, uh, it, it is an additional part-time job. I, I easily spend 20 hours a week working on council. Um, and my focus on that has been um, and remains on affordable housing and homelessness. We have a sadly very uh, rapidly increasing homeless population in the city of McMinnville. And so we are working very hard um, to put policy in place that can address homelessness mm -hmm. um, and can address our affordable housing mm -hmm. um, issue. I, I, I shy away from the word crisis, but, but, but we are on the uh, true heels of crisis. And so with that, um, I've really started saying, uh, well, I say no now. I just, I can't do more than counsel. Yeah. Um, uh, not well and I don't see any point in doing things if you're not going to do them well so um, and in terms of why I have just always been civically driven mm -hmm. minded I've always wanted to be involved um, I think it was just the way I was raised it, it just it, it comes very um, innately and intuitively to me to to be in to be in the, that role mm -hmm. so um, it's a pleasure to do those things could we see mayor remy in the future nope no not gonna happen mayor in the city of mcminnville is definitely a full-time position <laughs> even more than and it is also um an unpaid position as is council and why i am happy to volunteer <laughs> all of those hours, I do still have to <laughs> pay my bills. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not planning on retiring for a long time and it, it currently the mayoral position for the city of McMinnville needs not only somebody that um, is very versed in a broad range of um, topics and really understands the inner workings of the city, but it also needs somebody that can dedicate at least 40 hours, if not 50 or 60 hours a week sure. and we have a great new mayor and he is phenomenal to work with and he's he has the time he's very intelligent he spent a long time uh, working with and for the city um, as a counselor for many years before that and uh, for me it's about the goals we're working towards it's not a personal goal to achieve a, a title or a, a there's no status associated with it it's just about the work sure. yeah sure. so you you've grown up in the industry and you've you've been in McMinnville for for much of your much of your life uh, talk to me a little bit about the changes you've seen in the local industry and in the kind of the statewide Oregon wine industry from what you can remember to what you see now Sure, changes uh, can be difficult, and I think uh, culturally we're scared of them. Um, I try not to be scared of change, but there's been a lot of change. I mean, when I was a kid, wah wah, <laughs> uh, 
you know, literally everybody knew everybody. I mean, you could actually throw a party and invite the entire Oregon wine industry, which Nick did regularly. Mm -hmm. um, those were great experiences. We Nick's Italian Cafe recently had its uh, 40th anniversary, mm -hmm. and it was like the most unbelievable walk through memory lane, you know? Um, so now the industry's huge. I mean, you couldn't throw a part. You couldn't throw a party and get everybody there, <laughs> let alone have a space mm -hmm. to to hold the entire Oregon wine industry. So, you know, it's grown tremendously. Um, and with that, there's a lot more diversity. You know, you still have a lot of people that are very quality focused, but you also have wineries that are very quantity focused. And not that one negates the other, um, but it can. Mm -hmm. um, there's also very large wineries that are focused on both quality and quantity. Um, there just weren't large wineries mm -hmm. <laughs> then. Um, uh, you know, we're seeing some diversity in the wine industry. Um, I think we have changes that we, we need to, to see more changes. I think we need more diversity um, in the wine industry. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot bigger. I still feel like there's a really good community spirit here. Um, and I hope that remains. I think uh, in all of my f uh, not being scared of change, the one thing that I'm really scared of is that we'll someday lose that. Mm -hmm. um, because it, it, it is a, it is a, a, a gem uh, it, it is a, just an amazing part of the Oregon wine industry, how supportive um, wineries are of one another and the people in the wine industry mm -hmm. are of one another. Mm -hmm. and, and, have you, and I assume you when you talk about the size changing, the competition also has to be pretty fierce uh, among, for, I mean, all the wineries trying to sell their wine. So have you seen that start to change those relationships a little bit or has it stayed, has it stayed pretty community focused? Um, I used to have this story that I would tell um, about the bakery, uh, the restaurant bakery in Pittsburgh. Um, one, this is true that one day a new bakery came in uh, to the area. We were in this little pocket in the city uh, called the Strip District, like open air markets and mm -hmm. um, lots of, you know, ethnic markets and um, this new bakery came in and they were in front of our bakery and they were giving away free samples of bread and trying to direct people down to their bakery. And I just went out to this guy and I said, you know, what are you doing? This is not, like, we're not in competition with, an, with one another. The whole goal is that we're offering a product here, which is this, this part of the city, this community, the whole draw is to get people here. Mm -hmm. It's not to buy your bread or my bread. It's that they come down here because they have the options of buying your bread or my bread. The competition is Panera mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, corporate bread baking company. That's the competition. Um, so I've always felt that way about other Oregon wineries as well. I've never felt like I'm in competition with another Oregon winery. It's always been that what we are offering communally is a product. Um, now, I think it would be naive to say that, to, to ignore the fact that, you know, we have some big wineries that have just bought in in Oregon. Um, so, who knows what will come of that or how that'll, how that'll change. My hope is that they will really remain or just contribute in a really positive way. And I think that they will. The truth is, is that even though some of these larger corporations are buying in here now and establishing wineries, they've already been producing wines here for, for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, my take on it is that they're recognizing that what we're producing is a really quality product that is brand Oregon, mm -hmm. and they will only contribute to that.
I don't know if I answered your question. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm boring you to death. <laughs> no, this is great stuff. This is great answers. These are wonderful. Um, so you talked a little bit about diversity in the industry. Uh, for you, what's it been like uh, being a woman in the wine industry? Um, being a woman in the wine industry, I think it's just like being a woman in the world. Anywhere else, you know, you encounter, um, you know, you have less favorable situations and uh, you have, you know, and then you just are a, <laughs> a lot of the time and you don't, you're not consciously aware of being a woman until somebody else points it out <laughs> or until, uh, you know, a truck driver asks for a man to unload his truck. <laughs> Um, which is absolutely, I mean, that is not a hypothetical situation. Sure. Uh, that has happened, I and mean, there's been a lot of things that have happened. I think at the, at the end of the day, it's more about um, just who you are and, and, and trying to be comfortable with that and not letting other people raise those doubts in, uh, about you or your abilities um, because you're a woman. So, um, oh, and I've had a lot of really good female role models, you know, I mean, I was kind of brought up w with strong female sure. winemakers sure. as my, um, as my guides. And so that's, um, you know, been very natural from mm -hmm. Louisa Ponzi to Veronique Joanne. I, there was never a doubt in my, in my mind. It was never a consideration kind of, mm -hmm. you know, if this is an appropriate role for women. And, and in fact, as Patty Green likes to point out on her very funny shirts that say women taste better, <laughs> physiologically, <laughs> theoretically, women have um, uh, a actually have an, uh, palates that are able to sense some things. Now, I've never read those papers. I don't know. <laughs> I love the shirt. Um, yeah, so I, I, think, I think the challenges are the same that they would have been in any, any industry in the world, is my guess. That, you know, we just, we keep pushing forward, but it's 2017 and uh, women just are not yet at a place where they have equal footing with men, whether it's um, salaries or any other... Mm -hmm you know, anything else. Sure. Uh, luckily, we're in Oregon, and Oregon's, again, very loving and embracing, <laughs> but, um, you know, yeah. it, minorities have challenges. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and on that same topic, you're part of the LGBTQ community as well, and a very, a very small part of the Oregon wine industry at this point, point. and what has that been like? That has been much more challenging than being a woman. Um, I think a lot of it uh, in my own fears though, um, really a fear of rejection um, with my customer base. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I've been out really since I was about 16 years old. Um, but I found that when I started the winery, all of a sudden I felt this need for privacy. Mm -hmm. um, but that privacy, you know, privacy is kind of the nice way of saying it. I was scared to be out. Um, not amongst my industry peers mm -hmm. at all, um, but purely from a wine sales perspective. Um, uh, but, you know, I've changed a lot in that time. I would say, this is not a politically correct thing to say, but you know, I look gay, <laughs> but I didn't always, you know, I had long hair and you know, mm -hmm. things like that, but a lot of that was um, not really feeling comfortable with, with who I am. And I don't know why the length of hair matters, but there's certainly, um, you know, there's certainly a, a comfortableness with being who you are. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that was really hard. In fact, we had the big change for me was really only a couple of years ago, not physically, physically, like everybody else, I change constantly, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. but, um, but we had somebody working here, he was gay, and he would out me to like every customer <laughs> that came in. And I was like, 
what are you doing? <laughs> like, well, why do you keep outing me? Like, I don't want to be outed. Like, I am, I am, I'm, I am, I'm out, but I'm, I'm not out. Mm -hmm. And that was really hard. Um, that was, that was really hard, and, and it was a emotional roller coaster, um, trying to be an out proud lesbian and being terrified of letting people know that I was gay because I was scared it would affect wine sales. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't need gay wine community. Um, I like gay wine community. <laughs> uh, I certainly like the support of gay wine community, but when I say I don't need gay wine community, like I don't need to know other gay wine makers. It's great if you're a winemaker and you happen to be gay or if you're a winemaker and you happen to be anything else in the world. <laughs> to me, the winemaking part of that community is the most important part, not any other part of our identity. Um, I just want to know and be friends with good winemakers who I can share information with. Sure. So there's not a, a need to form community in that instance. But there is a need to have some community um, in terms of being gay. So. The, that's hard in a small town. Mm -hmm. um, there are not a lot of gay people here. Um, and it's important because there's shared experience um, and there's a, a cultural um, understanding and there's an understanding of some of the trials and tribulations that, quite frankly, you just don't experience. Um, you know, you might be able to have a similar experience, not you, but one <laughs> might be able to have a similar experience, say, of having to tell your parents a huge secret, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if it's anything else, it's probably like, it's something that's passing, right? It's a, mom, I, did this bad thing, right? Usually it's right. Uh, secrets are associated with something that's bad. And um, so when somebody understands that, that process and what it took to kind of get to that point, um, then that community is very, very important. Um, so I think being gay in McMinnville might be more challenging than being gay in the wine industry because mm -hmm gay in the wine industry doesn't really matter. Being gay in a small town continues to have its challenges. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm, not that I feel discriminated against, mm -hmm. because I don't. But there's, but I'm still like, I don't know, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I think this is gonna sound egotistical, but I'm probably, <laughs> and it's not meant to, but like, for McMinnville, I'm probably like the best known lesbian in McMinnville. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I just am. You know I, I'm on city council. Mm -hmm. I have a business here. You know yeah. what I mean? Sure. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm out in the community, and I'm out mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. community. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't mind having some more gay friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't want to be the token McMinnville gay I, person. I right. don't want to be right. the token. Right. McMinnville gay person, and I'm not. There's a fair number of, you know, there's some gay people here, sure. but like I'm pretty sure that I know most of them, <laughs> and sure. it's a small group, yeah. you know. I'm also Jewish. I'm pretty sure I know most of the Jews <laughs> in McMinnville too. Like, you know, it's just there's just something about like there's, you know, there again there's a cultural understanding, and I and I'm sure that that is true for any subculture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, when there there's commonality. Um, you're just able to have a, a, an understanding that sometimes other people don't have. My wife is, um, comes from a family that uh, had a restaurant growing up. And so we've always had this amazing connection and understanding because we both grew up in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That commonality for, you know, that commonality for us is much more important than being gay. Of course, we wouldn't be together if we weren't both gay, but, you know, that but that shared understanding, that shared history mm -hmm. is essential. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. Thank you for what, thank you for articulating all of that because that's a, it's a complicated question, a complicated answer. I really appreciate that. Um, what's in the future for Remy Wines? You talked a little bit about this earlier, but uh, 
any other changes coming down? Or are you just trying to kind of simplify and keep keep everything rolling? Yep. No, we we want to do. We want to just be making the best wines we can make and um, giving our customers the best experience we can give them. So there will be changes. This you know farmhouse um, is a big part of that change, um, but uh, but really the goal is you know we're we're already doing. I feel like we're doing things right. We're making good wines, and we are delivering a really positive customer experience. You know, we're a five-star rated business on <laughs> Yelp. Uh, so not a lot of people can say that. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal, it's right? Just, so just continuing down that because um, I really believe that you have to continue evolving. And if you don't, I mean, we all took biology. We know what happens if you don't adapt and evolve, <laughs> right? It's true. So, it's true. so that's the goal: adapt and evolve. But there's not a there's not a thing that we're working mm -hmm. towards other than that evolution. So you talk about customer service a little bit. I'm always when people talk about focusing on customer service, I'm always curious when you are um, adding people to your team. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you judge? Like, how do you judge they're going to be good customer service? What do you look for in a person that you hire? So we do a series of interviews. Um, we I start off usually doing an individual interview. Um, uh, my wife will also interview with me. Um, just allows for a more dynamic conversation. Mm -hmm. Pick up on different things. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. I can tell you if you show up late for an interview with me, you don't ha have the job. I mean, there's just sure. no, I, I, I can't stand lateness. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of other parts to it. Can you conversate naturally? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and what am I hiring you for or to do? You know, are you methodical about X, Y, and Z? Mm -hmm. um, um, I would like to only have people work here for a very long period of time. Um, we've had successes and failures mm -hmm. with that, mm -hmm. um, but that's, that, remains, that remains the goal. And we have a lot of, you know, with people that work here of all age ranges, um, we've had all sorts of diverse backgrounds, um, culturally, socioeconomically, um, you know, so there's there's no there's no one factor other than kind of I need to be able to see myself working with you because my my hand is still very much in every hmm. pot. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean it's it just is. There's no there's nothing that happens here that I'm not completely aware of. I am not taken off guard by things that happen here. <laughs> sure. <laughs> not not always go the way I want them to go, but. Um, you know, the, it, it, at the end of the day, it's it's really looking for um, can you work well with others? Can you work well alone? Those are very mm -hmm. important things for almost every job um, in a small business like this. Um, and how do you interact with people? You know, do you set them off, or are you happy? Are you happy? That's really important. I don't want anybody coming to work that is negative like there's just there's too much negativity i think in our world so you know can you bring a positive um can you bring a, a positive outlook to to work every day can you come in happy and happy to be here stories to share mm -hmm. you know sure. are you willing to kind of make this the best place it can be every day sure so we talked about the future for Remy. What about the what do you think? What do you think about the future for the Oregon industry in general? What do you see happening in the next, say, ten or fifteen years? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, I have no idea what will happen. We're at a time of great change, and I don't know. I don't know what. Um, I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. We're at a point of change in a lot of ways. Uh, I mentioned the economics of our city earlier. That's huge. Mm -hmm. um, 
I have no crystal ball. Mm. I, I do not know. I am a, I'm a hopeful person, <laughs> as I've already expressed. Um, <laughs> but I just couldn't begin to imagine where we'll be in 15 years or five years. Just <laughs> next year. <laughs> or next year. I, can, I, can, I plan for us, sure. but I can't, uh, I can't plan for the Oregon wine industry. Sure. Um, n not beyond my own limit, you know, my mm -hmm. own limited involvement. I say limited because, you know, we're one small winery with one small vineyard mm -hmm. working with a couple other small vineyards, but, you know, I don't have I'm not driving I'm not driving the ship of the Oregon wine industry sure. we have good people that are though sure. so do you think there is a do you think it will more generally do you think it will continue to grow or do you think there's a cap on the like amount of vineyards and amount of wineries in the state do you, do you see it getting bigger than it is now I think most definitely it will get bigger I only hope it doesn't get too big mm -hmm. Um, what, what would be the, what would, how would you describe too big? What would you, what would make you think it was too big? If I went for a drive and I didn't see a hazelnut <laughs> orchard, I only saw vineyards, that would be too big. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, if we saw the death of other agriculture at the hands of the Oregon wine industry, that would be too big. Um, you know, diversity is not just about the color of your skin or sexual orientation or your religion or any of those things. Diversity is important when it comes to crops. Mm -hmm. um, it's important when it comes to land use. Um, we, uh, on our land, we could plant more acreage, mm -hmm. but we would lose the biodiversity. And that's a sacrifice that uh, we're not willing to make um, so, yeah, too big would be nothing but wine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. What advice would you give someone who was looking to enter the industry in 2017? The same advice I have always given. Don't do it. No. Um, <laughs> I'm only kind of joking. Um, okay. In all honesty, you have to do it because you're passionate about it, not because you want to make money doing it. It's just not a money maker. My goal has never been to make money. My goal has always been to make good wine. And uh, that is just absolutely the essence of what you need to work in the wine industry. If you want to make a fortune in the wine industry, it's not going to happen. There's maybe a couple people that are, you know, mm -hmm. taking home big paychecks. This is not the industry to make money. You want to make money? I don't know what you do. Sell real estate? I don't know. I've software. never... Software? Uh, software. <laughs> there you go. Startup? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Stockbroker, maybe. <laughs> you can make money doing that. Um, doctor, go to school more. If you want to, you know, if the goal is make money, become a lawyer, mm -hmm. become a doctor. You can make a lot of money that way. I, I think. <laughs> I don't know. They're not my industries, but uh, it's my understanding this isn't that. So just to, to really follow your heart, I mean, if you're passionate about winemaking, then you should do it. And if you want to make wine, don't wait till you, you don't have to, if you are an emergency room doctor and you want to make wine, you can retire and get a job in a little winery, or you can make some wine in your garage or your laundry room, mm -hmm. and you should, you know, you can plant a few vines in your backyard, or I'm sure you can go to a grape growing region in or around wherever it is you live, because they're making wine in all 50 states. Mm -hmm. So there's, there are grapes out there. So go get some grapes and make it, make wine. And, uh, See if you like to drink what you made. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, go from there. And, and you know, like 90% of winemaking is cleaning up. You know, you make a big mess, you clean it up. You make a big mess, you clean it up. The cleaning up takes more time than the winemaking. So, um, let go of the, any romantic notions, follow your heart, which I, in and of itself is romantic, so mm -hmm. it doesn't really make any sense, but whatever. <laughs>
do it only if you're really passionate about doing it and uh, and only make good wine and more importantly it's as important to be a part of a good team uh, as it is to have your own fill in the blank we have a lot of micro wineries god bless them but you don't need 200 cases of wine with your own label on it you can be a part of an organization like Remy Wines mm -hmm. <laughs> or like Argyle or Ponzi or you know any number of other organizations where they're doing good work both in um, what they do for the community at large but also in the quality of the wines and we need I think it most importantly, what we need are people that are passionate about wine and passionate about, passionate about being part of a team like that. We really don't need ever expanding brands, mm -hmm. you know? We, we just, I know it's, I know it's like hypocritical because here I am, I mean, literally my name is on the building <laughs> and on the label, I get it. Um, but it is as essential to have really good qualified people that are just willing to be part mm -hmm. of a good company um, that aren't necessarily looking to do their own thing mm -hmm. or they do their own thing but they do it for friends and family like I was talking about mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you know making your own distribute you know your own little amount but not for not to not for a shelf placement not for all of that sure. um, okay. And you, and you spent a lot of time working on really good teams before you finally got your name on the building too. So you have, you have, you you, you worked your way up to where you are now by being on good teams. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I am a hundred percent where I am because of the people that were around me and lifted me up and gave me opportunities and possibilities and mentored me and taught me, um, and trusted me, um, and scolded me. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I mean, really, sure. I. Uh, that that has been as formative a, as anything else, and and um, that's why I'm so focused on creating a good team here, is because there's nothing really like that. Um, that is being part of a really strong team mm -hmm. where people are always learning from one another and communicating. We do weekly staff meetings. Um, everybody talks about what they're going to do. It doesn't matter if you're in production or you're in sales. You communicate what you've got going on. More often than not, somebody goes, oh, well, I'm already going to be driving to such and such, and I can pick that up for you, or, or something like that. But they're, they're, they're much more than that. You know, they are a time that everybody sits down, has a cup of coffee, how was your weekend, you know, mm -hmm. what happened here. They're a coming together time. Um, and uh, I, and I, think, I think it's, it's crucial, mm -hmm. crucial to that idea. Okay, well that's all the formal questions I have for you. Is there anything else <laughs> that you would like to mention or anything I forgot to ask that I should have? I don't think I could possibly <laughs> say anything else. Well, <laughs> I didn't anticipate being so verbose. You, but <laughs> well, we are really appreciate when people are verbose. That makes my job a lot easier. So thank you so much for your time and for, William, for sitting with us. Thank you.